there's some noise coming in the background, um, Anushka. I request all the participants to mute themselves uh, as we're about to begin with the session. Uh, sir, I think the noise has uh, died down now. Uh, thank you so much, uh, since it's 2.30 uh, p.m. IST uh, by my clock. Uh, I think we can begin with the session for today. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi, I warmly welcome you to day two of the first iteration of our flagship conference on domestic governance in China. The conference is being organized by ICS in partnership with the Center for Policy Research, New Delhi. I, Anushka Saksana, am working with ICS as a research intern, and I shall be facilitating the session today. This fourth session of our conference will be geared towards understanding the governance of science, and techno science technology and innovation, or STI, in China. It shall aim to examine the governance structure of modern China in innovation, its adequacy for the growth of principal components of STI, the risks and the efficacy and resilience of China's governance structure to deal with them given that STI depends on the global circulation of ideas. And the speakers for this session shall present papers in tandem with this overarching theme in mind. Joining us as chair for this session is Mr. Ravi Bhutalingam, honorary fellow Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi, and founder and chairman of Manas Advisory uh, uh, Gurdam. Joining us as speaker is Professor Chen Dongmin, Dean uh, Professor at the School of Innovation and Entrepreneurship and Director of the Office of Science and Technology Development, Peking University, Beijing. The title of his paper is Reshaping China's Science and Technology and Innovation System in a Turbulent Time. Also joining us as speaker is Professor Stephanie Bame, Research Professor at Sciences Po, Dean of Sciences Po Undergraduate Studies, Collège Universitaire, Paris, Visiting Professor, Ashoka University, Sonipat, and former visiting professor, Xinhua University, Beijing. The title of her paper is, Can an Isolated China Meet Her Scientific Dream? Also joining us as speaker is Professor V.S. Ramamurthy, Emeritus Professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bengaluru. The title of his paper is Breaking the Glass Ceiling, China's Emergence as a Global play Player in Science, Technology, and Innovation. Joining us as discussant for the session is Professor Rakesh Basan, former professor of economics and JSW professor of innovation and public policy at the Indian Institute of Management, MW. The complete bios of our speakers can be perused in the conference brochure on our website. I shall also be sharing the same on our chat box. Before we initiate the proceedings of the session, I request that the audience follow some housekeeping rules. All participants are requested to stay muted during the presentations. Questions and comments can be posted in the chat box and the participants are encouraged to raise these questions and comments at any time during the event or one can raise their Zoom virtual hand during the interactive session. Please unmute yourself only when called upon by the chair or the facilitator to do so. The proceedings of this session will be recorded and live streamed on the ICS YouTube channel. I now hand over the floor to the chair, Mr. Bhutalini. Thank you. Thank you, Anushka. And Welcome one, once again to this session, which I think will be absolutely fascinating. Fascinating because probably science, technology, and innovation will hold the key to whether China achieves its centennial goal of becoming an advanced country. I say this because there are a number of headwinds that China has faced in the past, despite its absolutely fantastic record of development in the last 40 years. One of those headwinds is falling productivity. It has a number of factors, I won't go into it, declining population and adverse uh, aging the profile of that population, environmental stress, there are a number of factors. But to reverse that falling productivity, the main key nowadays all around the world is innovation. So 
China has a big loan uh, to take to meet its target. Particularly so because in very recent years, still more adverse factors have entered the scene. Particularly in the last two years, we have the zero COVID policy and we have the trade and technology war with the United States. Both these factors threaten to constrict the flow of scientific ideas and innovation across uh, different countries, across different zones, across different societies. And we all know that scientific advance is very dependent on the circulation ideas. So we have a situation where a, 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 a great power, China, with an extremely formidable infrastructure of scientific assets, and we will hear more about it, is facing a very challenging situation in advancing its scientific goals. It is now our eminent panel, and they have been introduced uh, uh, by Anushka a little earlier. I'm not going to say anything more about them at this stage except to say that they are all internationally eminent and renowned in their fields. So it will now be up to our speakers to unravel the situation and throw light on their projection of how the scientific and innovation future is going to pan out for China. Now, my role as chairman is not to say too much, but just that. I'm going to stop here right now, and I'm going to invite our first panelist, Professor Chun Dongmin from Peking University, to take the floor. Dongmin, the floor is yours, 20 minutes. Can you see the slides okay? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to join the session today. I also attended uh, some of the presentations yesterday. So uh, I want to thank for the Institute of uh, China Study for inviting me to participate in this discussion about the, the, the domestic governance of, uh, of China. Uh, I'm going to share some of the information or data about how China being developed its national innovation system today and what the Chinese government is doing, trying to reshape its uh, science technology uh, policies in the current um, climate. Uh, so uh, as we all know that China in the past uh, several decades have accomplished uh, economically uh, very, very uh, remarkably that have advanced into the second largest economy in the world. Uh, China today contributed about 70% of world GDP, only second to uh, United States uh, of about 25%. Uh, China continued to uh, grow at about five to five and a half percent, while United States growing at two and a half percent. So if you based on those numbers, you can project that somewhere along the night between 2030, or 2035, uh, Chinese GDP would overtake the United States to become the world's uh, largest uh, uh, economy. <clears throat> now, in parallel to develop its economy, uh, the, the rapid growth economy allowed China also to uh, advance its national innovation system. So this data is the Global Innovation Index uh, report in 2021. Well, China now been ranked at number 12 globally. Uh, China particularly doing quite remarkably in past five years from 2017, ranking at 22, then up to 17 in 28, 14 in, 20, in 19 and 20. And by 2021, 20, China ranked now at number 12. China is also the only middle income nation 
that uh, rank within 30 that, uh, of the high uh, income economy. Uh, this chart is probably more graphical and interesting. It is also part of the horizontal axis is the per capita income. The vertical axis is the innovation index ranking. If we see on the very right side, it's big bubble, is this more advanced economy where the, the per capita income is relatively high. Uh, the blue circle is the middle income economy. Uh, the dot representing the country, the size of the dot uh, representing the population of the country. As you can see, the China now ranking the number 12, it doesn't belong to the middle income group. And neither it belongs to the advanced uh, economy, e economies. Uh, in terms of the innovation capacity, China now clearly have ranked among the high income nation, but it had not achieved the high per capita income as the other countries in this group. <clears throat> Incidentally, I also show India here ranking, ranking at the number 46. So India also has a very large uh, population. So from this chart, you can tell that China actually, in terms of innovation efficiency, uh, based on its capacity to actually have not achieved the economic outcome that at this level innovation uh, can achieve by other country. And therefore, since last Communist Party Congress about five years ago, China have called that during this, the next five years growth period will be a high quality growth in Chinese. I, I, in my understanding, the high quality growth is to increase the, the efficiency of the economic uh, or innovation uh, input and investment. <clears throat> so if we look at the details, uh, this is the chart showing the total uh, IND expenditure uh, by 2021, China now has spent the highest number of R&D expenditure, about 2.35 its GDP. So it's about $620 billion, more than the United States as a nation. But as a per capita income, uh, this number doesn't rank as high. <clears throat> this chart showing the total number of researchers that, uh, that China uh, today is actually, again, is the well, uh, highest number, produce highest number of researchers, roughly about the same as the entire EU at together, and it's a little bit more than uh, the number of researchers in the United States. So in the past several decades, China now have accumulated a very large uh, number of researchers. Uh, it's about one and a half, between one and a half and two million. <clears throat> the uh, higher education continue to change uh, more PhDs, and you can see from this chart, China now annually adding about 100,000 PhD into its research forces. So roughly in 10 years, it will, add, will gain another million uh, PhD candidate. <clears throat> uh, so this chart showing the academic publications, and you can see that in 2018, China now have produced the highest number of uh, uh, academic papers contribute to the world publication of about 20%, uh, more than the United States of 16%. And here you can see actually uh, India here is doing quite well, it's ranking the numbers, number three, about 5%. So China, uh, Chinese scientists have published very large number of papers. Now in terms of quality, Chinese publication also uh, raised quality very quickly. Uh, by 2018 to 2020, the top 1% high quality cited paper, uh, China contributed 27%, more than the United States of 25%. <clears throat> so the quality is also improved rapidly today. And by the way, this is a research done by a, by a Japanese uh, uh, institution. If you look at the specific area where China uh, increased the publication uh, or highly cited papers are mostly in life science, medicine, engineering, and material research. In addition to publication, academic publications, the patent application uh, also rise very quickly in China. We know by 2012, 
the domestic application is already ranking number one uh, from Chinese uh, companies and, and researchers. But we consider only the higher quality pattern, which we use in PCT as an indicator. And even with PCT patterns, uh, China now in 2019 had produced almost 60,000 PCT patterns per year, the highest uh, country compared to United States and Japan. <clears throat> so now China has many patterns. Uh, in terms of the venture investment, uh, 2018, roughly China had about a hundred billion investment comparable to the United States. So these two countries have the very largest uh, uh, venture capital investment. <clears throat> now this venture capital obviously drives uh, successful in startup companies. Uh, and in 2021 survey, the China now has about 300 uh, unicorn compared to the United States has less than 500. So unicorn, as we know, is being a startup company where before it went public, uh, being, rent, uh, being valued at 1 billion US dollars. So uh, in 2021, China have 300 such a companies. <clears throat> now, having said all the great numbers, there's one number that is very, very uh, different. And that is the global innovation corporations, where in this chart, uh, only uh, get to the top 100 is only one company, and that is Huawei. Uh, maybe this is not quite fair to China, but we, regardless, it's not, not a 10% or 15%, it's, you know, it's one or few percent. So indicating the Chinese companies actually are not as innovative compared to those in the United States, Japan, and Europe. <clears throat> and one of the reasons, obviously, is quite uh, apparent. Uh, what China has been developing in the past several decades it is a massive manufacturing capacity. Now, as we know, manufacturing in the global value chain to occupy this, this, this middle section is its actual low value added, as opposed to innovation R&D on the left here, it's high value added, or a branding uh, and also design services that's also considered to be high value. So therefore, Besides the very large capacity of Chinese economy, it's actually mostly coming from manufacturing. <clears throat> and this is where China today, it need to move up to the high value added uh, sec uh, sections, including create more branding and more uh, domestic uh, uh, design product control the channel, as well as enhance the R&D and uh, research and, and, and product design. In 2018, uh, one of the very important newspaper, uh, Chinese uh, technology uh, daily report, uh, the editor has its uh, uh, journalists have visited Chinese companies and produced a 35 serial report. Uh, from April to the month of July. Each report focused on one particular technology where China rely on import uh, to support its uh, industrial uh, infrastructure. And here we listed 35 technologies. I didn't have the time to uh, convert them to English, but I will just summarize it. Um, the report altogether have 35. Uh, and the title of the report is the tip of the iceberg. This series of report is to warn Chinese industry that it's a vulnerability of too heavily dependent on import technologies. So if you summarize in this certified technology, it consider be only a tip of iceberg. They are mostly in four important categories. One is advanced materials, Second is the production equipment. Then third is industrial software. And number four is precision instrument. As we know, these are the most fundamental uh, infrastructure for modern manufacturing. So in other words, this report trying to warn the public or the government where the massive capacity of made in China are heavily depend on imported technologies. <clears throat> So uh, 20 China 
Made China 2025, therefore, have called for the country to, at least in 10 important technology sectors, to uh, reduce external dependency by uh, internal uh, innovation. But this initiative had met severe um, resistance uh, from the United States, as we know today. Uh, although it started as a trade deficit dispute uh, during Trump administration, uh, China-US uh, dispute had quickly escalated escalate into a, a technology war, as uh, Ravi mentioned earlier. The uh, United States have controlled technology import to China by controlling the Chinese company investment in the United States, control the export, and by adding uh, uh, taxes on Chinese technology product. But more recently, the uh, United States Department of Commerce used this uh, so-called so entity list uh, instrument to uh, strict restrict technology uh, to uh, specific Chinese companies and institutions. And you can see that I, I put on top of here, last time I gave this presentation about last year, it's only 80, but today it's double. It's double the number of this. And in the list, not just companies, but it's also Chinese universities and research institutions. Um, the, the, the reason uh, is the so-called national security concern. <clears throat> Uh, in addition to technology expo, I think that the United States also have applied some unusual instrument uh, to control technology to the Chinese uh, corporations, including uh, having uh, Canadian legal forces arrest uh, the CFO of Huawei uh, company. And this is the well-known uh, uh, legal cases eventually got resolved. So uh, let me just uh, use in a, one particular sector to highlight the criticality of the dependency of Chinese uh, manufacturing on imported technology. As you know, China now has the world largest uh, consumption of IC chips. This number is a little bit hard to convert. It's 100, 100 million RMB unit. So it's basically, it's basically uh, 250 billion um, Chinese uh, RMB, right? So it's about 300, I think it's about uh, two, 250, uh, two, two, five, uh, 2,500 RMB, uh, billion RMB. So it's about 300 billion US dollar. With such a huge chip consumption, uh, domestic supply can only, um, can only provide about 30%. The other 70% are all rely on imports. So the IC import is now exceeds the import of steel and, um, and, um, and it's greater than steel and oil combined together. So it's, a, it's the largest import uh, China uh, had to Sorry, rely on. Okay. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit. So and therefore you can see that China has built more than 46 fabs across the country and all these fab heavily depend on equipment. And therefore you see the United States now initially banned EUV fossil soccer free to China. And now it's also trying to persuade uh, uh, the, the company to extend the ban of the, the, the soccer free machine to the DUV. And recently we just hear the news that the US now restrict EDA tools for gate all around re, uh, design to China. And furthermore, uh, just two weeks ago, now US uh, uh, forbid the AI processor being exported to China from NVIDIA and MAD. So as this, this continue being extended, so it caused a great deal of concern. Um, obviously, uh, China tried to step its effort. Uh, in 2014, launched a national ICC fund about 100 billion. And last year, they uh, created a phase two of this fund about double that, about 200 billion. And this is expected to, uh, to uh, lead to uh, both government and private funding about 150 billion US dollar investment. United States on the island recently passed this uh, US CHIP Act uh, and would create about 53 billion US dollar to uh, beef up the uh, chip manufacturing in the United States. 
So therefore, uh, looking at all these numbers, obviously uh, one of the most urgent uh, policy is for China to create uh, 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 incentive or initiative to significantly reduce dependency on technology import, particularly the critical technologies. And just this week, this past week, the CPC Central Committee meeting uh, on, in this meeting, Xi Jinping called to mobilize national resources to call technology breakthrough in key uh, sectors. If you look at the Chinese uh, government structure, uh, we have uh, these all the organizations uh, that drive the Chinese domestic innovation uh, system development, including education ministry, Ministry of Industrial Information Technology, Ministry of Science Technology, National Development Reform Commission, uh, Ministry of Health and Population Control, Academy of Sciences, and National Science Foundation. All these are key organizations that drive the China's uh, policy. The way that it works that yesterday we talked about a lo local government, the, all these organizations have a uh, corresponding offices in the provincial level and down to the county level. So when a central ministry issue a new sort of strategy or policy, it could drive through on its own uh, uh, the branches and go all the way down to provincial and to the county level. And so this is a very efficient way for China to direct its policy and implement its policy. So in, in, recent, in recent year, uh, particularly last year, uh, there are four important changes being made. One is the military education now had the focus of reform on create more WE uh, uh, students. So the government's not happy about the education program where the WE students are overly uh, spending time on learning theory and basic information knowledge, but are not enough training in their uh, skill set. The Ministry of Education, on the other hand, have reformed national labs and IMD centers to call for these centers to be more aligned with the strategic alignment of the uh, reduced dependency of foreign technologies. Uh, the, NR, the, the NDR Commission is driving uh, a setup, a step up of a set of uh, a national larger scale research facilities. And last but not least is the military industry and now it's focused on fostering technology specialized SME to beef up its internal uh, supply chain. The overall goal is to accelerate critical technology development uh, internally to secure domestic supply chain and engage global supply chain more effectively. <clears throat> so here, uh, China has now designated four uh, so-called uh, comprehensive national innovation center, one in Beijing, one in Hefei, one in Shanghai, and one in Shenzhen area. So in all these centers, uh, they have both uh, basic research as well as translational research. Just give an example in Hefei, uh, the, China, the, 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 the center has been developing space earth quantum communication, advanced light source in X-ray regime, also uh, tokamak uh, nuclear fusion centers, and uh, as well as the ultra high field MMR. These are the world class, a large uh, R&D infrastructure uh, being developed in Turkey. And in the local so, level- Can I please request you to conclude? You close it, close okay, up. I'll, be, I'll, I'll be done in a second, okay? All right. So in the local level, the Shenzhen in the area where it created a hub of technology translational research. So you can see this is so-called the, the Big Bay area where the, the Guangdong government have created more than 10 labs, each focused a specific technology sector area. Um, the whole drive for us is using the regional government uh, money to invest in the so-called Death Valley or proof concept research and using private money uh, to do the, uh, in the R&D phase. So, so adding tremendous resources, trying to take in more results from the basic research to translate into the marketplace. This is the lab that I'm being, I have been uh, since the last five years. This is all complete developed in the last three years and we are now moving into this new location. In the lab, we developed more than 30 technology that, that being translational into a commercial applications. So this is my last slides. 
So with all this new effort, we can foresee the, some of the consequences. One is the, the perform, the reform of higher education program, especially in WE will unleash a large pool of skillful H, uh, human resources. The second is the focus of translational research on technology commercialization will turn China into a powerhouse of technology supplies in broad industrial sectors. The third one I can foresee is the massive investment in larger scale science facilities will further raise a Chinese global status in basic science research. I think that we can see that China had to build a very sound foundation to follow in its national innovation system and to, to, to achieve these goals. And uh, so this concluded my uh, sharing uh, of this information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dongmin, for a, a really fascinating presentation. Uh, I know uh, it uh, must have been difficult uh, to condense all this into, into 20 minutes, uh, but it, you have presented a very cogent picture of how China's government uh, and academia have analyzed the channel challenges facing China and how each arm of the government and each part of the research and commercial establishment has been mobilized in order to tackle the priority areas that those challenges have revealed. Uh, and this story is playing out as we speak. You mentioned some developments which have just happened a few days ago. Now to carry on the story further, uh, I think it's very appropriate that our next speaker, Professor Stephanie Balm, her subject is going to be very relevant. Her paper is titled, Can an Isolated China Meet Her Scientific Dream? Uh, so Stephanie, over to you now for your 20 minutes uh, to tell us about uh, what you see uh, happening from a European perspective. <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Professor Bukalingam, and, and thank you, Professor Chong Dongmin. It was really interesting for me to listen to your, to your speech, really. I, I've learned a lot. And really, congratulations for these two um, kind of, um, it's a marathon, these two two-day seminar um, that really maps your center in New Delhi on the uh, map of China studies. So I'm, I'm really, really uh, happy about this uh, incredible, um, you know, ambition that you have. So um, when we discuss Ravi about the topic, I already, you know, shared with you some of my doubts. And so I think it would be, um, as we are all academics, it would be fair to say that my contribution today will be mainly to raise questions and to share with you all my doubts about a very, you know, tricky problem and difficult question. Um, and so um, I will start by um, describing maybe the overall context of the situation, which is the uh, very few people know about China's STI. And uh, I'm actually at Sciences Po teaching a class on the uh, on China's science te technology innovation today from an historical perspective from the end of 19th century to nowadays. So. If I just wrap up a little bit and say the overall context, there are two important timelines. First one is the absolutely amazing, you know, rebuilding process of China's scientific ecosystem since 1980s. And when we say rebuilding, it's because there was one China's ecosystem, modern one, which existed in the 1910s to 1940s, which has been destroyed for many reasons. And so China was back on track in 1980s. Now we are in the 2020s. And it's, we can reflect on how China rebuilt its ecosystem. And China rebuilt it through domestic reforms, but also because right away, when Deng, Deng Xiaoping decided to reform its system, right away China's new scientific ecosystem was put in the heart of global science. The internationalization, process and reform of China's STI went hand in hand with its own domestic reforms. 
when you look at research mobility, students' mobility, right away, the, you know, you, the new MOU signed by China with the uh, rest of the world, with France, with EU, with uh, the US, was to send students abroad to welcome students home. So the question of the internationalization of China's STI is really a bizarre question, because from right away, these last 40 years, China was at the heart of China's global science. So this is the first aspect of the timeline. And the second one is we know China's ambitions. China's scientific ambitions are so global. Basically, the idea is to make China in the year 2050, in the mid 21st century, the first scientific global power, a global scientific power, okay? At a time when in the in this century, the 21st century, science is when it's at the top level, by definition, global and by definition, interdependent. Okay, so it's very bizarre to imagine that there will be a European biology uh, top science and American one and a Chinese one. It's all very much interconnected. So um, now the questions are, is China's science tech innovation rise serving as sort of an engine for protectionism? Is China's turning inward scientifically? If so, why, how, and what are the consequences for the other scientific players around the world? Okay, okay? so first of all, it seems that it's a fact that China is growingly turning inward or at least since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we can you know, trace it back to January 2020, uh, China has closed its border to the world, has adopted also a growing closed nationalist discourse. And there is also this idea of, uh, not from the US perspective, not from the EU perspective, but from China's perspective, the idea of a sort of decoupling strategy from these, the rest of the world, and in particular, what is uh, called the Western-led system, right? Uh, with the idea that China could pursue its own path of building its own system with Chinese characteristics, okay? So I'm rationalizing a posteriori what has been the zero COVID strategy effect on science, okay? Well, actually, the reality, I mean, the way I understand it um, from now, it might change in the future, but what I understand it now is, first of all, this idea of turning China inward, of decoupling China's uh, science to the rest of the world, is not consensual within China. There are tensions, there are uncertainties and probably divisions within Chinese universities, within the Ministry of Education, uh, and probably within the political system uh, itself. Um, and also, um, this question of China, you know, getting, uh, turning inward, is not only the consequence of a political decision from the Chinese government, it's also the reaction of what have been the recent strategies by, by some key scientific players around the world, and the first of, of these players being the US. And so I fully agree with Professor Chang Pong Min. From China's perspective, if China is turning inward, it's also because they have to react to what is perceived as a sort of regression from the US government in particular. So I think we should not, uh, not take into account the fact that the US government recent initiative, and I think we can track it back to Trump's administration, and it's mainly under Trump's administration, but the Trump's administration reaction to the China's rise in science have also created along the conditions of the pandemic, pandemic 19, the conditions for China to look inward, okay? So what I'm going to do now is <clears throat> maybe look at it from the Chinese perspective, and to see the ambiguities from China, and then talk about what has been Trump's key initiative in reacting to Made in China 2025, which has been which has been a policy called the China Initiative. What has been Mr. Biden's decision recently, and how you know, uh, and a little bit about Europe, and then we can wrap up with all the doubts that I would like to share with you. So when we say China, and so China is turning inward. 
And, and, and I feel that it's a reality, but also it's not a consensual sort of uh, decision. I would like to take the example of the recent uh, declarations uh, around the issue of the university world ranking system. So you might have seen, you might have heard that after uh, Mr. Xi Jinping visited uh, Renmin Taishue, the People's University in China, in, uh, of China in May 2022, he you know, delivered a speech and also some uh, university presidents of China have delivered speeches saying that, you know, that they um, might you know, not want to continue be part of the international, um, uh, of the global ranking system, okay? Um, and it's, this is really um, counterintuitive for external analysts. First of all, because the, um, China has been a, a, pioneer, a pioneer in building uh, world ranking university um, indexes back in 2003 with Shanghai Jiao Tong University when um, they have decided, and it was absolutely brilliant, to design a um, world ranking university system while they were not Shanghai Jiao Tong at that time a well known university at all around the world. And I remember being, you know, having discussions with uh, some of the key leaders who were at the origin of this initiative uh, 15 years ago, and they were telling me, you know, by the time we will be on the rankings, um, it would take us maybe 30, 40 years, and we better rank the others instead of being ranked and never be at the top. This is what's really smart for soft power of Chinese university, okay? And even if you look, when you go now on the official website of the Shanghai Tiao Tong um, Academic Work, uh, World Ranking University, um, they explain that their uh, ranking of world universities is recognized and this is a world use as the precursor of global university uh, rankings. They do believe this is the most trustworthy one and that present the world's top 1000 research university annually based on transparent methodology, objective third party data. And they know that their system have completely changed the way we rank universities around the world. And also China has you know, uh, only had two university that made the top 200 of the Times Higher Education in 2016. Now there are um, about seven, if I'm correct, uh, with Tsinghua and Beta being in the top 25. All of these you know, right? And so it's bizarre to see that China was a pioneer in this um, you know, uh, ranking international system. And now is saying, well, um, we have achieved really good development regarding rankings, but we uh, we want now to be, we might not want now to continue to be part of the ranking system. Well, actually, if you look at it very, you know, um, in depth, what you see is there are at officially only three universities which have decided to somehow withdraw from international university rankings. Zhenda, Nanda, and Lanzhou University and maybe others, but it's not officially, you know, reported. And these universities are good universities in China, but not the best. And surely around the world, not in the top 200, not even in, the, uh, except for Nanta, which is 130 or so 40 university, but they're not the top, okay? Uh, so they're not the top universities, but still a sort of a trend. So um, it's obviously a political decision, um, it's not in China's long-term interest. Um, and um, we can wonder that Chinese universities have already gained global prestige from their rapid rise in the international rankings. And now most of them may see little gain in somehow settling for a sort of plateau, okay? So my understanding is that the best universities will continue to be part of ranking systems well actually the less good ones might not be completely involved in it okay another thing is as you might know and i don't know about india but there is a growing criticism of world ranking universities around the world um you know asking for more qualitative greener uh indexes including academic freedom indexes and at this point you know China's university might feel that they will be challenged 
by a much more qualitative you know, evaluations of university, okay? Uh, um, so, um, and, and, and also I see there is also another ambiguity because so far, it's been two years and a half that China's university have been closed to the rest of the world, mainly because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And, um, um, in, and, and, um, and as they can't concretely welcome students, they propose a system which is called internationalization at home. Somehow it's online learning from China to uh, with uh, inter international students. And we know that these can't continue and go on. So on, you know, in-person exchanges are absolutely important for China to keep a high level of international students. And at, a week ago, the Minister of Education said that they were ready for return of international students prepared a new visa policy for 57 countries, but still has been very difficult for him to implement. And I know that it's a huge issue between the Indian government and the Chinese government. So just to say that we try to understand what's going on, it's not easy. It's not easy to see China somehow wanting to stop, you know, a process where China was a pioneer and it's against its interests and seems to be that it's cast itself from the rest of the world on this particular case of world ranking system without any pressure, pressure from, the, from the rest of the world. Now I'm moving to the second aspect, which is, yes, China is turning inward because of the reaction of the rest of the world to China's rise in STI. I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm just describing it, okay? And for sure, when you do research, you see a sort of different attitude uh, in the EU and in the US before and after the big program of the Made in China 2025. And very often you will listen to uh, sp speeches by uh, American presidents and EU member states leaders um, saying that they have lost their naivety, that they have realized the importance of China's STI around the world, and they had, we needed it to build up a new strategy so we can somehow, you know, compete with China's rights. In the case, so it's also interesting to see between the EU and the US that there are common sort of um, assessments about China's rise and also key differences in the way to you know, uh, perceive China and to deal with China, okay? So we can see in the US and the EU this idea that we, from the EU perspective, definitely the EU needs to continue to collaborate with China. It's not for sure in the US, but both sides believe that there are some scientific risks. Uh, from the EU perspective is we should be aware of this risk, but we need to continue our collaboration. From the US side is uh, the idea that lack of reciprocity, the unfair, unfair playing field, the problem of in, uh, intellectual property rights, plus the sort of political risks, as Washington says, with this idea of interference by China, techno-nationalism, a new regulatory framework. I mean, you know all of this and it will be really, I don't have the time to go on details. Anyway, uh, this is idea that there is a high degree. Sorry to interrupt you, Professor. Could you please conclude in five minutes? Okay. Okay, so that would be really, so I have to. Okay, so I will be very quick by just saying that due to this um, environment, uh, the, under the Trump administration has been decided a, 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 a policy called the China Initiative, okay, uh, which has been a, a key focus of the, you know, it, of Trump's policy um, and uh, launched at the end of 2018, recently stopped by Joe Biden after an assessment. Uh, this China's initiative policy by the U.S. was to um, basically, and I, I remember the term was to thwart and punish academic researchers who funneled economic and military research to China. Actually, the assessment asked by Joe Biden about this policy would be interesting to really look at it in details, but due to lack of time, I'm just going very quickly. The assessments basically uh, after three years of, um, you know, legal um, and, uh, um, battles, 
was that 28 uh, people were charged and only four convicted for having, you know, too close relations with China. Um, and so Mr. Biden said, basically, uh, this needs to stop. Uh, so they, they, they stopped the China initiative. It's no longer used. But still, when you look at it, its functions are folded into Department of Justice National Security Divisions. And so even if there are major differences in the way Joe Biden's look at and research on, I mean, and, and use China's initiative, it's still there. It's still there and um, it's um, uh, basically um, increased the sort of hesitance to say the least, to collaborate with scientists from China when you're an American uh, academic and with the fear of a sort of conflicting national interest. So, um, and the Xinhua, Chinese Xinhua's agency has reacted to it by, you know, has reacted to it by saying that, you know, these um, collaboration between the US and China was made impossible due to the um, American stand on, on the question. Um, it will be important to say a few things about how American uh, scientists react to, to, to this and do, are they, you know, do they empower themselves? Do they say anything? You might remember the open letter by 180 professors at Stanford University in September 2021 uh, condemning uh, the politicization of US-China science uh, collaboration. But Clearly, it's um, an issue in the hand of politicians much more than in the hand of academics. Now, let me uh, some. I mean, just say one word about Europe. The scientific cooperation be between US and China is it's still active, but growingly difficult and growingly sensitive due to a growing number of very recent uh, reports. Um, you know, um, denouncing. Uh, the collaboration of EU uh, academics with China, making us in a very academic, in a very difficult situation. And also it's difficult because we can't have access to China right now uh, due to visa issues with the COVID-19 pandemic, okay? In July of this year, uh, the European Commission is trying to, is, is basing, basically saying two things. We need to continue our collaboration in China. We also need to know much more China as a reality, um, and also the Western universities, according to the EU Commission, needs to be more prepared to what they called a sort of geopolitical shock. Um, and what is this geopolitical shock? And that might be a difference with the US and the rest of the world is now we have a war in, in the middle of Europe and the, 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 um, the political stand by the Chinese authorities on the Ukrainian war. Um, is very related to what we're talking about. Why? Because after the war, after the war started six months ago, a series of scientific sanctions have been designed by the European Union uh, against Russia. Okay, the scientific sanctions have been a sort of shock for the uh, um, scientific community because we, as scientific, we want to collaborate with even countries with war sometimes, believing this is the only way to bring peace. Just to put it simply, why does that affect China is because stopping collaborations with Russia doesn't mean a lot for European, neither American science, in a way that, you know, the level of collaboration is very, very limited. But our level of collaboration with China is absolutely huge, is important. The level of interdependence is extremely, is extremely huge. So the question starts to be, what if we will be in a situation of scientific sanctions in the future? And so this is a general climate, okay, the very, the general climate, which is really um, increasingly um, uh, difficult, okay. So um, I don't have time to say everything that I wanted to say, but at least, um, first of all, my takeaway message is, unfortunately, during research, engaging in research became a political issue uh, between us, between all of us, us European, uh, I mean, us Western scientists with Chinese scientists, and this is a pity. Then the years to come, uh, 2020, starting from now, and the next three years will be decisive. It's really too soon to tell. 
things could change, you know, again, if China's, uh, you know, visit restrictions are lifted, if there is no more confinement, I mean, uh, less confinements, if there is no, um, it's, it's easier, is a mobility in between people is made easier. It might be the case that two STI system will exist. It's not only de uh, two decoupled STI systems around the world, but within each country, we can feel the difference. Let's say the Ivy Leagues will continue to communicate and have, you know, uh, exchange scientific experts and do science together, while the rest of our, within our countries, the non-Ivy League institutions within each of these countries are stopped of any international cooperation with China, and that will be a pity. Uh, but at the end of the day, definitely, as Professor Chen Dongming said, China can't make it without global science, but neither do we without China science. So, um, um, I will end it up here because I know it's been really too long and, 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 and probably very confused, but I, I, at least it was really nice to share my doubts with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, I particularly uh, want to appreciate uh, how deeply you have thought about these questions. Um, and uh, to my mind, some of the immediate uh, offtakes of what you said are that this this so-called isolation cuts both ways. As you said, scientific circulation of ideas goes in all directions. Science develops through taking ideas and developing them from wherever. And so uh, whilst uh, the sanctions might disrupt China's growth, they would also affect scientific development, not only in the EU, in the third world, and even in the United States uh, itself. Uh, and, and so I hope the politicians were listening when you talked about risk and clear assessment of risk, because obviously that is one way uh, to look at it and not do all of us harm, because there are issues like climate change, which involve everyone, which will suffer very badly if that happens. Thank you once again. Now let me move to our third speaker, Professor Ramamurthy, and he's going to talk about breaking the glass ceiling, China's emergence as a global power in STI. Uh, and I requested him to say a few words about the implications of all this in India. After all, we are also a closely interested and connected part. Over to you now, Professor Ram. Thank you very much. Can I, I was just trying to see the figures of our screen, yes, share the system audio, share. Aha. Can I can I have my overhead, please? So would Hello? you like us to share your uh, PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sure, sir, I'll do that. Thank you very much. Yes. Can I move? Can I move this up and down? Uh, no, oh. sir. Unfortunately, I'll have to move it. I'll request you to just say next slide and I'll switch it accordingly. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. The the emergence of China as a major player in science, technology, and innovation is one of the outstanding global development during the last two decades. Through a series of critical intervention, China has been able to achieve not only global competitiveness in higher education and research, but also leadership positions in several cutting-edge technologies with huge economic and military consequences. Chinese universities like Shiguar, 
Beijing occupy relatively high positions in several international rankings of universities across the world. During the last few years, China has overtaken the US as the world's top research publisher in science engineering. China also leads the world in patent filing to facilitate development of high technology products and high technology enterprises. China has also been nurturing innovation and entrepreneurship as an integral part of the science and technology infrastructure. It is not surprising that China's GDP is racing ahead and China is emerging as a world leader in several areas of high technology. What I want to concentrate is today is what were the critical interventions that led to these developments? How come in 20 years China has moved from one end of this to the other end? I want you to recall just 30, 40 years ago, say the um, cultural revolution period, um, China trained no new scientists, no new engineers, and science and was not on the uh, upper end. After Mao's death in 1976, the new leadership under the Deng Xiaoping reversed many of the policies of Mao in particular, it was recognized a strong science and technology base would be mandatory to safeguard not only the long-term security interests of the country, but also its economic interests. This was a major change. And higher education and research were also re-established as pillars of modernization. This is a change which took place in the 70s, which is not very much, very much back. What were the critical interventions? I have been trying to see something must have triggered this. You may say everything, but something must have triggered this. I could see four critical interventions. I'm sure you can also see it. In the 80s, 1986, a program to strengthen research and development, not only in security technologies, but also in all emerging technologies was put in place. In 1988, shortly after that, a program TARCH was launched, which nurtured innovation and entrepreneurship. You could immediately see this is, a, this is almost the same as the US model of the 60s. Strengthen science and technology research and strengthen innovation and entrepreneurship. Now, the next two de next decade, 1988, beyond that, two things happened. Number one, the, pro the programs were suggested by a group of scientists. The other important thing in program 863 is it's not related to only security technologies, but it is any emerging technology, whether it, whether it is uh, um, biotechnology, information technology, artificial intelligence, a whole range of them. That means they were not separating out the security technologies and the uh, non-security technologies because that separation is very difficult to make. The second thing is on the program TARCH, this is basically to convert knowledge into wealth. US has benefited from this and uh, China also recognized it and um, a lot of programs are put in place to strengthen innovation. The three strategic sectors benefited. Money was not a problem. The, both the programs were very highly supported. The strategic sectors did benefit out of this, but what is important is, did it benefit Chinese science in general, publications and things like that? Looking back, no. During that period, if you really look at, there were a lot of encouragement for NRI scientists, non-resident scientists to return to China. They did high quality work, they encourage many people, but also had uh, um, offshoots. Like, for example, many of the scientists who had not gone abroad well, felt bad that they are not treated on par. And when things do come from outside, there is always a, a criticism that China is uh, stealing IP. So you may remember in the last two decades, China was accused of uh, taking away IP from various other places. 
the chinese starch program also was not moving as much as it should like a, like a silicon valley or something like that the rate at which the, that was going up there was not seen in china and uh, two things were recognized as a result of this number one both the programs h63 as well as starch did not have a human resource development they were based on the on the existing human resource or from elsewhere it didn't succeed as much so in the 90s two other interventions were brought in this is the uh, 211 project 211 1995 and project 2985 uh, 1998 what is the highlight of these two projects both were aimed at strengthening institutions educational institutions and strengthening the human resource train more people message was very clear make investment not only in r&d but on the development of required human resource because r&d is done by human resource and you have to build an innovation enterprise ecosystem which also again needs manpower if there are no people any amount of infrastructure is not going to lead to a new innovations or new enterprises so the that two programs in the 90s were clearly focused on human resource development the two programs in the 80s were based on are focused on funding and identifying areas of research next one please i want to give a simple picture growth of the first university degree holders in natural science and engineering bachelors you can see immediately for our almost all countries is almost the same in china beginning of 2000 to end of 2010 the first decade of the 20 21st century there is a steady increase in the number of degree holders simple degree holders it was not flat like in all the other countries next one please where do they go some of them good number of them go into further research phd degree holders does it show up there you can see it here uh, between 2000 and 2010 and uh, the china almost went from 5 to 30 every other country is almost the same even in united states it has not gone up as much but china is definitely went up in a very big way in india it is almost flat there is no change at all next one it also shows up in the r&d personnel per million population it's a it's a huge country one third one sixth of the world population is in china it started up with about 7 60 people 60 people per million population and it has gone up by almost by a factor of 10 a factor of 4 so clearly the number of r&d personnel is increasing steadily over the decade it's just a decade between 2000 and 2010 now you may ask maybe there are other reasons for this frankly i could not find any other reason it's a investment in education investment in educational institutions next once the number of phd's are more number of institutions are more r&d spending is also more you can really please see here immediately between 2000 and 2010 uh, the r&d investment has been growing very fast in china and in very few other countries so clearly it is the money is going also into r&d next one well what's the impact of all this in 10 years only it is only a question of 10 years what is the impact of the all this okay r&d is uh, funding is increasing number of people who are doing phd is increasing number of people who are doing research is increasing what is the use of that the proof of the pudding is in the eating we, we do it so that the economy of the country will go up and here is the gdp of the three countries united states china and india you can see up to 19 2000 india and china were almost running parallel very little change united states was far ahead between 2000 and 2010 chinese 
are by your economy is really shooting up again correlate with that correlate with the human resource correlate with the investment in r and d so this this is what we wanted anyway and now this is happily continuing and china has realized that this strategy works and they have gone ahead and in 2018 they have gone ahead and announced another initiative which this basically says we will we will have good educational institutions but not good in in china but it good in the international the international universities have have, have been um, seeded and more international universities are coming up there is no question about that now now having seen this up to don't forget india and china were almost running parallel to each other from 1950 when they became independent to year 2000 there no change at all i will call it as a um, is a locus of uh, uh, developing economy and no big change continues life as usual china deviated and went up now we ask ourselves as i am coming from this country hey, what is it we didn't do india became independent in 1947 now india has always said we will take the path of science and technology right from 1947 india has always had a tradition of science even when we were under alien rule uh, we had good universities uh, we had uh, english language is a big advantage and uh, we were familiar with the western educational system and there was also a long tradition of scientific research like for example we had uh, jc bose sn bose cv raman yaman saha they were all internationally known scientists even when there were no uh, big institutions the early start in strengthening education research infrastructure after independence did result in several success stories like for example we always talk about the green revolution in 1960 india was a food starved country we used to say hand to mouth existence and then the green revolution came and today india is a sufficient uh, food we have no shortage of uh, food at all quality of food may be different the distribution may be uh, uneven but there is no shortage of food similarly we had uh, generic generic drugs industry when we became independent we used to import even aspirin at a very exorbitant rate today uh, generic uh, drugs is uh, we are self sufficient we export no problem on that and uh, you have seen in the recent case of the covid we could even uh, develop uh, a vaccine indigenously in uh, areas of high technology such as space nuclear and defense technologies india has already demonstrated capabilities we are we are not talking about competition with anybody but we are able to take care of our interests so one question which we have keep asking ourselves the rate at which china is moving in the last 20 years and the rate at which india is moving in the last 50 years the same path why is it so and can india survive chinese competition in the coming decades this is a matter of concern for most of us more importantly we ask if if we can't compete with china we can't blame china for it what india should do to ensure that you have a, a rather strong uh, science and technology background and we get a place in the global space uh, we are also one sixth of the world population there is no reason why india should be much poorer Uh, than uh, any other country with us having the same size i have again looked at this where are the major differences the first thing which caught my attention was china and india have the largest educational system in the world with comparable undergraduate in, in, in numbers for example every year something like uh, uh, 30 30 million people uh, are there in the undergraduate Large student population because a large population, where one sixth of the world population also has one fifth of the six of the students. However, when it comes to postgraduate research and doctoral research and vocational education, India has been lagging behind China considerably. This is one thing which we uh, which we noticed. 
the lagging was the same up to 1990 that that was corrected by china in the last 20 years which we have not yet done for example you might be aware of the iit graduates iit graduates are there in demand across the world their quality is uh, absolutely out of um, any doubt unfortunately the number of doctoral students in our iit hardly exceeds about 10% whereas in the typical university i, I am sure our, my friend will uh, support my statement that something like 30% in the pijing or tsinghua university goes into research students higher level our standard universities are even worse they have only graduate education tsinghua university has 50000 students we have no institution of that size in india i have already mentioned the number of researchers per million population in india is about 250 while the corresponding figure in china today is about 1500 and in united states is about 4500 in the last couple of years before so clearly india has to quickly augment postgraduate education and more students into r&d this is what china did in the 90s and early 2000 and that is something which india needs to do the story is similar in vocational education presently india trains about 3 million skilled workers annually whereas it is estimated that india needs about 13 million a year something like 4 to 4 5 times in a year is required vocational education trained people skill developed people are the ones which are who provide the backbone of any industry without them there is no, the only only the scientists cannot run an in industry unfortunately skill development is not part of our formal education system this needs to be corrected in short if you want if i have to summarize india needs to recognize and education r&d are not expenditures they are investments for the future this is something which china realized in the 80s and in the 1980 1990 china has shown that the payback of this investment is very quick we need to scale up india has to scale up postgraduate education and research and india needs to further strengthen the ecosystem for innovation and entrepreneurship that is the one which converts knowledge into money china and india ventured into technology based innovations and entrepreneurship approximately at the same time 1887 1987 1990 that's the time when uh, the uh, the first initiative came with support from united nations fund for science and technology uh, we started on this while the chinese program moved forward indian program was almost dormant till 2000 for almost 10 years nothing was done when india started this incubator program with a clear policy in 2000 china had already established near 200 technology business incubators they are already far ahead and as of today china has already home to more than 3000 incubators housing more than 200000 small and medium size enterprises with further ambition to increase their number including a few incubators overseas like in australia for example <coughs> in contrast we are still having about 300 to 400 active incubators this is much much less <coughs> ironically the five indian experts from entrepreneurship development fund amdavad played a major role in preparing the chinese program of incubators this time the un experts were from india and one of them continued to be a leading consultant to the chinese incubator program but they have gone far ahead we are still behind <coughs> i would like to also mention here china needs to encourage participation of industries and other non government agencies in education research business incubation and skill development somehow this has still remained with the government sector which is not i think it is not good which is not delivering as it should professor in short, i would like to mention here 
Look, you need to close up. There is no resource. I'm through. There is no resource like the human resource. This is one lesson we learned out of China. We, we knew it, but we also didn't follow it. And we have to learn to behave like a country of 1.3 billion people. We are, that's, that's our aim. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ramurthy. I think your presentation was extremely focused. Uh, you laid out the specific steps that China took to develop uh, its trajectory, its accelerating trajectory um, in the field of science, technology, and innovation. And in particular, you highlighted what exactly India needs to do. What are the lacunae? What do we need to do? And in what steps? I think those are very useful. And I hope those who are going to implement this have been paying careful attention uh, to what you said. Uh, now I'm going to request uh, our eminent discussant, uh, Professor Rakesh Basant. Um, you have a difficult task, Rakesh, of, uh, of looking at these three very rich presentations and giving us, giving us your views, uh, giving us uh, your input into these important ideas in the short space of 10 minutes. So go ahead. We are waiting for you. Um, thank you very much, Ravi. Uh, uh, I have no intention of uh, summarizing the presentation, and I, have, I don't think I can um, do justice of providing a critique uh, to these uh, very insightful presentations. Um, what I want to do, uh, like Stephanie was trying to do, raise a few questions. And uh, my task is actually somewhat easier now because Stephanie has already spoken because some of the things that she said, I also wanted to say in terms of uh, science-related collaborations internationally and, and so on. Um, <clears throat> let me begin by saying that all these presentations have brought out very clearly that China has uh, had significant, remarkable achievements in the area of science, technology, and innovation. Uh, whether it is R&D expenditures, patents, and publications, uh, they have done a, really a great job. Um, and recent changes in the last three to five years uh, of consolidating uh, the uh, science and technology ecosystem uh, and trying to bring in interdisciplinarity uh, into uh, both science education and the technology infrastructure is something which is quite remarkable. And I've been uh, following some of that uh, in recent times, and I'm quite intrigued by the way they are able uh, to bring this about uh, in, a, in a very, very systematic uh, kind of manner. Uh, they have also borrowed things like Beidol Act equivalent, and they have things of that kind in place. Um, so I don't want to get into the details of what else they have done over and above uh, what was already presented um, uh, to us uh, by the three eminent speakers. What I want to do is uh, uh, raise a few questions in the um, larger context of market versus state failure. Uh, when it comes to activities relating to science and technology. And, and so uh, the question that I'm asking myself is that whatever has been done by China so far is extremely remarkable. And uh, the recent phenomenon of looking inwards, uh, what it might entail for this larger debate on state versus kind of market failure. Uh, as we all know uh, state intervention in any activity, uh, including science and technology related activity, uh, is uh, sort of justified by the presence of market failures. And all of us know that science and technology, the market failures are really, really high. Now, the fear that I have is by the recent uh, things that are happening in China, uh, particularly uh, looking inwards and also trying to do uh, a lot of decision-making at the state level, that they might be moving towards a situation where 
government failures might uh, affect them in the long run. And I, in the rest of my presentation, I'll try to elaborate on that particular point uh, a little more. Now, as uh, <clears throat> uh, the presentation uh, on China about what has happened in the selection of uh, sectors, creation of different kinds of centers, choosing fo focus about different kinds of technologies and areas that needs to be worked upon and pumping in enormous amount of money and investment in those uh, specific sectors is a phenomenon which is relatively recent uh, in, 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 in the Chinese experience. Now, one worry that might, uh, that people like me who have been looking at these expenditures over a period of time would be that, <clears throat> will that kind of uh, focus and investment lead to over-investment in certain sectors while some other sectors might uh, get adversely affected and may have uh, <clears throat> uh, implications, uh, negative implications for the future? Will this kind of a program lead to uh, some kind of misuse of funds or rent seeking that we all know about. Uh, and given the fact that uh, there is not much competition uh, for uh, raising these resources and you are pumping in money and you <clears throat> are not allowing competition from outside to uh, become important for taking these decisions, will this disincentivize, disincentivize for innovation. You may have some focus on certain areas of science and technology, but whether it will lead to uh, important commercializable uh, technology in outputs is something which may one, need, may one may need to worry about. And these distortions, to my mind, uh, may become much more problematic uh, due to the kind of protectionism uh, that Stephanie talked about and several other papers in recent times have uh, <clears throat> talked about with this extreme focus on made in China uh, and trying to produce and procure uh, most of the critical uh, technologies uh, from within. Um, as <clears throat> the earlier speakers have pointed out, the nature of growth that we have seen in the science and technology and innovation space in China was significantly driven by the fact that they were competing globally uh, and they were forced by global competition to make certain decisions, take calls about what to focus uh, in terms of R&D and innovation. Um, and so this certain idea that we should become, <clears throat> uh, we should not be import dependent in these kind of sectors uh, and try and produce uh, uh, all technologies on our own instead of depending on foreign technology uh, it might affect uh, the process of science and technology activities. I mean, uh, basically on the lines of what uh, Stephanie was kind of uh, talking about. Because <clears throat> foreign technology doesn't only bring in knowledge, it also, FDI also brings in competition and makes the market contestable and which makes your decision somewhat more <laughs> market friendly. So as a result, you may be entering into a situation where the market forces that are critical uh, for making right choices with respect to science and technology and innovation decisions are getting <clears throat> constrained by this policy. And the choices are increasingly made by the state, uh, not necessarily by people or associations or professionals who are uh, independent and autonomous, but through the advice of some of these professionals. So, there are interesting papers which point out that in a situation where state is aided by professionals in their decision making about choices of sectors and areas versus uh, the choices made by independent professional bodies with respect to where, what to fund, where to fund, how to fund kind of decisions. Uh, so you may enter into a situation where mar market failure is there because you're supporting competition through subsidization. Uh, and the government failure may exist because you do not have the wherewithal uh, to prof use professionals in an autonomous fashion because the state is more or less deciding what to do. Of course, they are taking advice from professionals. Now, my last point in the same vein is there are some interesting papers about how 
organizationally, this restructuring of the science and technology infrastructure is affecting or may affect the decision-making kind of processes. Um, so a major consolidation has happened in the science and technology infrastructure in China. Um, and the argument was that they, they were too far too many funding agencies. They were far too many agencies. They were working at cross purposes. And we are streamlining uh, mechanisms to use the R&D expenditure much more efficiently. But at the same time, uh, uh, there was some kind of a mutual competition that was taking place. I mean, the uh, people were taking decisions. Some things were for, uh, working out. Some other things were not working out. But if you try and uh, argue that we want to take all the decisions centrally and we'll consolidate, uh, you may end up taking wrong calls. Uh, and, and since you're focusing on specific areas, uh, without allowing multiple uh, flowers to bloom, uh, you may have situations where uh, you may end up having significant failures, which might hurt you uh, in the long run. And there are also interesting papers about how these restructuring has affected uh, interministerial relationships, uh, coordination across departments, and uh, the way of functioning has is being changed. Uh, will that result in some kind of state failure? Uh, uh, that's something which uh, I think the Chinese must be thinking about it from the perspective of an Indian uh, uh, <clears throat> person who is looking at science. Sally, we know about the bureaucracy and how it affects a variety of things in terms of uh, science and technology related discussions. Uh, <clears throat> so all in all, the core point that I'm trying to say is that the achievements are great. Uh, there is no doubt, no doubt about it. Significant investments have gone in, as uh, the earlier presentations pointed out. Uh, but the <clears throat> inward-looking process that is underway, uh, although uh, the political economy is such that China has to take some hard calls, uh, they may need to worry about the long-term implications of getting closed all over again. Uh, of course, the, the world is very different now as compared to what it was earlier. But uh, increasingly, they will find uh, not only partnerships in science-related uh, uh, activities difficult, but even th the trade-related um, kind of uh, linkages that provide significant amount of knowledge flows and technology availability, that be might become a little difficult for China moving forward if they start, looking, start on this inward-looking path. And ultimately, uh, they will have to sell their products all over the world. Um, and, and, and so they'll have to deal with the world anyway. I mean, you may not want to deal with them in science and technology. They'll have to deal with them in the trade of goods and services. Uh, and the two are very intricately linked. Uh, so <clears throat> trying to become self-sufficient in critical technologies, cutting yourself off from other sources might eventually have a, a major issue uh, as far as uh, other parts of trade are concerned. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Rakesh. I think um, I would urge the, the, the speakers to really pay close attention to what uh, Professor Basant has said, because uh, uh, the, uh, the, the questions he has posed, the thoughts he has mentioned, uh, it's not that I think you can respond to them in a, in a few minutes, the few minutes that we have left, but they are worth noting uh, when you finalize your papers, when you finalize your draft papers uh, for a publication, uh, uh, as we have already indicated, uh, because the, the, the views he has mentioned do have a very important bearing uh, on the development of the arguments um, that you've already made, particularly the aspects of state failure, protectionism, and the longer term effects of the so-called inward looking, the phrase, Stephanie, that you use has seems to have caught the imagination of everyone here. Um, so now, uh, let me go to the questions. We have just under 15 minutes. So I would like our speakers to be very, very brief in answering these questions. I'm going to mention them in order they've been written. So uh, please take 
try and take not more than a minute to answer each question, difficult as that may be. So, Dr. Ramdev has asked uh, uh, a question, and that is, how does China intend to share its indigenous technology with other Asian and South Asian countries for their economic uh, betterment? Would you give us a quick answer to that, Domin? Well, as I uh, share in my slides, I think that the, uh, the, the, by the, uh, the current status of Chinese economic development, China had to move up in the value chain. So in that, it's really focused on driving to move up in the value chain. So the fuller increase Chinese um, per capita income and the government called it as a high quality development. So in this particular day, uh, argument where well, China, it is a focus on domestic transformation. I don't necessarily agree that it's an inwardness. That is a necessary uh, transformation of China's economic development. Uh, the concern is now um, the China now trying to um, do since internally breaking up the dependency on the external. Um, that is China viewed as a national security uh, drive, and therefore government is calling for this particular period. Maybe it makes sense for China now to more focus on develop technology, internal supply of technology, to make sure its industrial sustain sustainability. So that is a necessary for China to able to continue to develop its economy. Whether this technology can be shared, I think it will be shared like any other company. You can buy Chinese component. You can buy Chinese, uh, licensed Chinese technology. I'm sure those probably would be just like any other uh, companies in the world. Uh, but there's a, there is a one thing that we have been uh, uh, talking to the government where the larger facility of development for the basic research, I think that those should be open to the scientists worldwide by submitting proposals like we used to do experiment in CERN in other large science facilities worldwide. And I think the Chinese government uh, are open to that. In fact, we have one of the uh, high field magnetic lab I visited about a couple of months ago. And in fact, the facility was developed in China, but the more than 50% of the academic paper are published by uh, scientists in Europe and the United States utilizing this particular facility. And I certainly hope that those, those policies uh, will be continued. Uh, so uh, back to the question whether we can share technology, I think that openly share probably not because they are developed by corporations, by, by investors. So we had to go through IP licensing. On the other hand, I think that China will be able to supply very high quality materials, components, et cetera, uh, as, as, as a result of this recent initiative that focus on more on technology commercialization. So maybe uh, because of time limit, I'll just I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dongmin. Let me move to the question asked by uh, Ambassador Rana. This is both to Professor Balma and Professor Chen. So I'll ask Professor Balma to answer first. Is the delinking of China's R&D from global partnerships likely to restrict China's future progress? Is this a regressive step, to put it bluntly? Will becoming an island unto itself hurt China? And let me add to that question, will it also hurt the rest of the world? Professor Balm. Sorry, Ravi, I'm really sorry. I think I couldn't hear the first part of the question. Therefore, I didn't get the meaning of the question. I'm sorry. Uh, he says, is the delinking of China's R&D from global partnerships likely to restrict China's future progress? Is this a regressive step? Will becoming an island unto itself hurt China? And I would like to add, also hurt the world? Well, it's pretty much uh, 
the same question that the, the question I, I, I try to raise in this presentation and, and I showed you how much it's difficult to answer to this question so far. I think it's too early to answer to it because um, we all st I think my understanding, I don't know what Professor Chen believes, but my understanding is China is still, you know, suffering from this COVID-19 pandemic situation. We are all, but I mean, the, the so most of the decision taking right now, which seems to um, make China appears as cut out from the rest of the world could change whenever the mobility is back. And so we need to wait a little bit. And this is not a way for me not to answer the question, but I think it would be reasonable not to have a very definite answer to such a huge question, because the way we look at China also has consequences in China. So, and, and I took the example of the China initiative. China's initiative has had effects within China to really um, 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 cut China from the rest of the world as well. So it's, we have to be very, we, I think we need to keep an open door to, China, to China's um, you know, uh, mobility. So first of all, wait and see, wait until when? At the minimum, this 20th party Congress, um, wait until 23 when the new Chinese governance is in power and we have a little bit more visibility. Secondly, wait also to what will be the reactions of the EU and the US at least in the next year about what is our strategy in dealing with Chinese science, you know. Um, and then if this is confirmed, this inward looking China, which Professor Chen explains as something necessary in China's development. It's interesting to have his perspective as well. But if it's still an inward looking, um, you know, uh, hypothesis, if it's, if it's uh, confirmed, uh, yes, then it means that the, the, new, the next step strategy will be more EU-US cooperation instead of EU-China, US-China. And this is remapping completely the way the world science is organized so far. Thank you, uh, Professor Balmer. So as you said, this is a moving target. Uh, we have to judge week by week, month by month, how this is happening. And I will also roll in Ambassador Kanta's question to this to check whether your answer is the same. Because he asks about the zero COVID policy having this also an isolating influence. And is your answer more or less the same to that question? Uh, I mean? Yes, me? yes. Oh, okay. So, well, some people say also that the zero um, COVID-19 strategy is a consequence um, or product of an attitude which is already an inward looking policy. So is it a consequence or a cause? It's a very interesting question. And uh, I guess it's both. Um, I guess it's both. So I think it's, it's um, the COVID-19 pandemic has just, you know, re-emphasized a trend which was there previously. Um, and so, and so probably, um, Yes, probably, and what we what we seems to observe in, 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 in scientific exchanges seems to be the same for businesses. Um, you know, businesses, European business says it's increasingly harder to invest in China, increasingly harder to to have staff mobility, increasingly harder to uh, uh, the the Chinese market is also very much inward looking. So so yes, I think so. I think it's. Um, we need to deeply think whether um, the new strategy of the Chinese government today is uh, both to have global ambitions and, and also global ambitions turned towards non-Western world um, and doing it with an inward looking strategy. It seems to be counterintuitive, but it seems to be the strategy right now, which is so different from the 1980s until now. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Professor Chen, uh, in one minute, can you add something to these two questions from Ambassador Grana and Ambassador Kanta? Well, I think the Chinese government uh, continue to uh, re uh, reassure the world that China 
China is going to continue to hold its open door policy. So this is, you hear this from the Xi Jinping himself, you hear this from the premier. Um, as far as we're concerned, we, we don't see how in short term China can close the door because China now export 35% of the GDP, right? So even China now moving to be a technology supply nation, it still need to export its technology to maintain its GDP growth. So I, I don't see how you can close the door and continue maintaining the economic growth target that you're trying to achieve. So, so that's number one. In terms of inwardness, I think that maybe, maybe uh, from a Western point of view, it's quite different from the Chinese perspective. But the Chinese government tried to encourage all sectors, you say, in over the past 40 years, China have done some experiment and find a different path from the Western uh, growth model. So China government tried to encourage people to create internally its own independent model and for shooting the common status of Chinese economy. Uh, I do agree that the Chinese society or economy is highly dynamic. So we should not uh, view China as a steady, static today policy probably after two or three years will be changing rapidly. And that's one of the things very difficult to operate in China because the policy uh, changes very quickly. Uh, one of the things I have to give the government some credit is the government is constantly looking at its own problem because of heavy uh, the, uh, policy intervention uh, and, and quickly trying to readdress these issues uh, caused by the bureaucracy or, or, or policy in the ineffectiveness of the policy, uh, policy intervention. So it is a very dynamic uh, country. It's a very dynamic policy system. So we need to engage to continue uh, talking to Chinese uh, business partner, political partner about all these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Dongmin. Uh, there is a question for Professor Ramamurthy. Uh, could you read it out, please, Anu? Uh, yes, yes, of course, sir. Am I audible? Uh, yes, Anushka, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid this will also be our last question as we're running short of time. So this question is addressed to Professor Ramamurthy. Uh, it's from Dr. Iram Ashraf. How would you defend um, against, how would you defend your argument that quantity uh, as in the case of scientific publications does not equate to quality. Uh, we have recently seen high numbers of paper uh, retractions by journals for papers from China. Do you think China has a problem in, in this regard or is there a bias against research coming from China? Thank you. See, quality and quantity go together. If you say I will only have good quality papers, you will not have any papers also. So both will grow and one will pull the other. If, if, if there is a bad quality paper, it will slowly disappear also. So I don't think we, uh, there is no absolute way of saying this is good quality and that is bad quality. Both will be there and the market will decide. And any person, in particularly in, a, uh, in the scientific field, if a bad quality paper originates from me, and people say that this is a bad quality, that itself is the force on me to not to write such a paper again. So it's a self-correcting system. Thank you, Professor Amurthy. Uh, this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. It has raised questions which we cannot answer in this very short period, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, so we will have to uh, live with some of these uncertainties but please follow the website and the proceedings at the Institute of Chinese Studies to see how this debate progresses, because we will keep this particular subject alive in our future developments. Now, it only remains for me to deeply appreciate and thank each one of our speakers and our discussant, your contribution, has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us uh, and for sharing your thoughts. And uh, we will be back in touch with you about further development of the papers 
and their publication in the weeks to come. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you. With, with this, uh, we, we come to the end of session four of the first uh, CDG. I express my sincere gratitude to the chair, the discussant, and the speakers for their remarks and also for patiently addressing the questions and comments posed by the audience. Uh, I also express my sincere gratitude to the audience for interacting with the speakers and for tuning in to the fourth session. Uh, we shall be hosting three more sessions for the first CDG today and the details of the same are highlighted in the brochure and the program available on the ICS website as well as about to be shared in the chat box here. Uh, we hope you will also find time uh, to attend our next session for day two on uh, new trends in the PLA and its role in governance, which is set to uh, commence at 4.30 p.m. IST, which is in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The recording has stopped. Value.